All right. Hello there, and welcome. This is the Modern Military History Podcast, episode number three. This podcast is a little bit different than what I've been doing previously, however, uh, still the same basic format. Um, I'm still finding my step, so to speak, with this podcast, so there might be minor variations here and there in terms of what I do, but I promise uh, every week I'm going to be bringing a new book, new content, selections from that book, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to learn some history. I know that doing this is a lot of fun for me, and uh, it's a great way for me to get after my passions. So thank you, uh, whoever you are, and however many limited numbers, uh, those of you who follow this are just making it all worthwhile. So thank you. If you are a fan of the Modern Military History channel, then you know last week I uploaded a Passchendaele photo essay. It was my first real editing attempt at anything, uh, and I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out. I'm a perfectionist by nature, so as I watch it now, I can only see what I've done wrong, but uh, I've been told by a lot of people that it was well done and they liked it. I want to keep pushing the envelope, and uh, I want to do another editing project sometime soon, um, and who knows what I'll bring. I, I like to do what I'm passionate about, and I uh, like to let that passion really guide my projects. Uh, you know, I will lose just, I'll just lose track of time uh, doing something I really love, and that's the kind of project I want to pursue right now uh, with my time, something that I get so into I forget how much time I've put into it, and that, that photo essay was definitely definitely something like that. So if you haven't seen it, uh, by all means, check it out. I put a lot of work into it. Um, it's pretty fun. Maybe that's the wrong, the wrong word for it, uh, but I digress. It was fun for me to make. I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it that way. Um, the book I'm going to bring to the podcast today is uh, the major book that I used to study that essay, uh, that project, and it's called Passchendaele, The Sacrificial Ground by Nigel Steele and Peter Hart. It's, uh, it's a good book, and it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it for the first book you read about Passchendaele or the Third Eep Battle. And uh, I'll get into that here in a moment, uh, but first I want to sing its praises. The authors have done a really good job with capturing the words of the men who are there, and, and that is the primary structure of this book. And that leads into some of its detriments. Uh, when you get into classical history, a lot of it's quite dry, um, a historian droning on for chapters in his own words, a lot of his own opinions, a lot of his own biases. And I think that Nigel Steele and Peter Hart did a good job with Passchendaele, the sacrificial ground, uh, because they let the men speak for themselves. They, it's, it's uh, let's see how many pages it is here. It's 317 pages to the end of the epilogue, and the vast majority of that is uh, block quotes from men who were there. So... If you're looking for a book, you can sit down, read rather quickly, and get a good general idea for the progression of the battle, the individual parts of it. It was a big battle. It lasted roughly from July 1917 uh, all the way until winter hit in December, um, so till the end of the year, almost six months, and six months of really hellacious combat, and I think uh, that was a primary factor that I wanted to get across in my photo essay, this kind of overwhelming series of events. At the beginning, I have just, uh, I think, four or five images of different places with the name of the place in the lower right-hand corner of the photo, and they all, for the most part, look the same. It's all just the same charred ground up muddy apocalyptic landscape and that's what the entire salient was and that's what the whole battle was it was just one slog after another so 
Nigel Steele and Peter Hart at the beginning of their book. They have an introduction where they do that kind of classical history where they break it down. They bring you the events of the battle. Uh, it's a little bit on the dry side. But they say at the beginning that uh, they're trying to subvert bias by bringing you the battle in the words of the men. And while that's that's pretty cool, that's really modern, sometimes it's hard to follow. And that's just because you're taking block quotes out of context, trying to weave them together into a congruent uh, history. And that can, that can be problematic, especially if it's the first time you're reading something. I know I supplemented this book heavily with other research to be able to understand the battle's progression and the broader scope of events. So if you're, again, looking for a book uh, to just kind of pick up and read about Passchendaele, depends what you're looking for. If you want to read, you know, from the guys who were there and their thoughts, this book is really powerful. If you want to read something uh, before this book, that would give you a better uh, framework with which to put this block quote filled text in then I think that might be a better route for the layman. I know that uh, maybe I should have done that because then I would have had to spend so much time looking up specific places and you know piecing it all together. And that's again, that's not really Steele or Hart's fault. It's just the type of history they wrote. With that said, I'm going to pretty much do the same thing they did. I'm going to give a brief overview of the history because one of the key pieces of feedback I've gotten from my video uh, are from people who wanted to know more about the battle. People who are laymen who I showed the video to who felt the emotion I wanted to convey but didn't quite understand what was going on or what they were seeing. So I'm going to give a brief chronology of the battle and then I want to dive into this book and bring you some of these really amazing quotations and uh, real words from people who were there. In the preface of the book, uh, the authors make a pretty good point of pointing out exactly their bias and pointing out what they're trying to overcome with this kind of history, this kind of uh, the men who were there oriented history. And I respect that approach and reading the preface and understanding uh, the message these men are trying to get through their work here is important. And they start right at the beginning that uh, I will read as follows. Preface. Historical military analysis of the First World War has developed a passing similarity to the theatrical and intellectual reassessment of the works of Shakespeare. Just as his timeless Elizabethan verse is frequently reinterpreted according to the fashions or convictions holding sway amongst the latest school of producers and actors, so the battles that raged on the Western Front have become the testing ground for the theories of military historians. So right there, you have pretty harsh words for their contemporary military historians and people who have fought, uh, come before, excuse me, uh, they're saying that people have taken the history and removed it from what it was to make their own points. And I think that's completely valid. I think a lot of, of that classical dry history uh, where you have a historian going on and on with his own emotions and thoughts, that's exactly what happens. There's considerable bias. Back to the book. But the terrible battles of the First World War are not plays to be performed on stage with no risk to life and limb, other than to some mishap with falling scenery. All right, folks. Now, in terms of historian speak and academic speak, that's, that's pretty scathing. That's a full-on broadside levied by these authors against people who have previously written about this battle. Uh... And, and further on down in the preface, they specifically begin to address what they do to fix this problem that they have identified. Back to the book. We do not claim that this book stands as a pure history of the Third Battle of Ypres. Inevitably, it is polluted by the times in which we live and our own shallow experience of life. Now, that, now that's important right there, because 
uh, these authors are doing a professional academic thing here in admitting their bias. When I went to college and studied how to become a historian uh, with undergrad, I'll be one of the first things they drilled into us in History 300, a uh, required course about the practice of history, was pretty much you have to say this. In any work you put out, you have to say in some form or another, I'm going to be making assertions here. I am a human, I am flawed, I have my biases, but I'm going forward into the history here and I'm trying my best to relay it objectively and an understanding that the objective quote-unquote truth is, uh, is a fantasy. Uh, you know, understanding and accepting that and admitting that is, you know, it shows. It shows that you are conscientious of the problem and you're doing what you can to rectify it even though you cannot fully rectify it. So that's a mouthful, but I hope you're, hope you're following here. Back to the book. Our method is straightforward. Into the simple textual mold which outlines the tragic historical events we have poured the personal experiences of the men who have had to endure the consequences of command decisions that they could not possibly influence. So here we go. They're removing that big picture scope, that classical scope, and they're bringing it into the micro history of individual men and their words. And as I said earlier, this can be problematic if you're not familiar with that macro history, that big picture already. If you don't already have that framework, a, a, a history like this can be a little daunting. So be warned. And they say that right there in their preface. And I think that's important to understand. So that's why I wanted to share it. So as I said, after their preface, the authors give a what they title gestation, an introduction uh, which they collaborated on to bring you a chronology of the battle, a framework that they want you to place their uh, micro-history within. So that's what I'm going to jump into here, uh, this broader chronology of the Third Battle of Ypres. And uh, it follows as this. So in 1914... The British Expeditionary Force landed in Belgium, and they were thrown against the seemingly unstoppable German advance towards the Belgian coast. Early in the war, uh, the Germans had this uh, familiar idea because they did they tried to do it again in 19 in, well they successfully did it in 1940, and then they tried to do it again in 1944 with the Battle of the Bulge, which was drive through Belgium and sweep around down south. Uh, from the north, you know, to cut off France and cut off the Allies and essentially impose a massive siege state on the Western Front. So their idea there was to pierce through Belgium, hit the Belgium coast, and then drive south and capture the vital uh, ports of Dunkirk and Calais and deny shipping access from England to those northern ports and really put the squeeze on France from the north. And then uh, other operations from the south would then come in and, you know, create a massive siege battle. That was the hope. But the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, was thrown into the line in 1914, and they stopped the German advance. And their dogged defense ended up leaving a massive bulge in the line around the city of Ypres. And that has called the Eep Salient, and that's what's prominently featured in my video. And pretty soon, that defense of the Belgian city of Eep became a symbolic stand against the unstoppable German line. Uh, the, the British quickly became rather idealistic in their fanatical holding of Eep, and uh, it became as I said, a statement that we are holding EEP, we will not let it go, and no matter what the cost, this will be our stand. So the EEP salient, you know, since the beginning of the war in 1914, was a bloody place, and it was a very important place, both politically and strategically, for the entire Western Front. Uh, and to understand that fully, I think you need to understand the geography of Belgium. 
which is something that they get into in the book a little bit, uh, but they, they don't do the best job at articulating that Belgium is completely, almost completely flat, and in some places, for the most part, less than 100 feet above sea level. So, in 1914, the area was very fertile. There was a lot of farming, um, a lot of rolling green fields and forests, and this had been maintained by the Dutch population. They had built an incredible amount of dikes, canals, and water diversion uh, methods to keep that low sea level drained and to keep the keep the landscape fertile. And you know they could irrigate it on their demand. So in 1914, when the first Battle of Ypres came, which was essentially a defensive action by the British, an offensive action by the Germans, a lot of that infrastructure keeping this low landscape dry began to get severely damaged. Okay, uh, Trench warfare was a warfare not only of small arms fire, but, I mean, when you can't directly shoot your enemy because he's below ground, you try to blast him away with artillery. And by 1914, artillery had gotten to the point of sophistication, roughly what we have now. The technology hasn't changed too much. Uh, I mean, it was a little bit more archaic back then, shorter ranges, but the premise of indirect artillery fire remains the same. Uh, You would need artillery to blast your enemy out of his trench. So this intense artillery bombardment began around Ypres in 1914 with the First Battle of Ypres. And that began to waterlog the country. It began to destroy all this carefully created infrastructure that had been built and maintained uh, over generations of Dutch farming. And this very low, flat Dutch ground began to get very wet. And that was was in 1914. And the first Battle of Ypres roughly went from mid-October to mid-November. And that's, that was the first battle. And I feel like that's important to talk about because it's the creation of this salient, the bulge in the line. Yeah, anyways, moving on, moving on. So, and then in 1915, the second battle of Ypres happened. And that was, again, the Germans who had made some headway. The British set up a very dogged defense of the city of Ypres and created this bulge in the line, the salient, stopping the German advance. But in 1914, the Germans had still managed to gain some high ground. And high ground is of incredibly strategic importance, especially in this low-lying area. The first fundamental thing about geography and warfare is if you're at the top of the hill, it's a lot easier to defend than somebody attacking uphill. And when you have a ground that, for the most part, is less than 100 feet below sea level, any kind of any kind of high rise gives you a very serious strategic advantage and especially since artillery is so important you need to be able to see for the artillery you need to be able to spot for them so that's what what this high ground became very quickly a great strategic importance to both sides so in 1914 uh, in that first battle of Ypres the British held the line and this kind of circle this semi-circle of high ground, this lip of high ground surrounding Ypres, some of it was captured by the Germans in their first push. It was just, they were overwhelming in numbers, they were overwhelming in artillery, and the British had to give some ground. They captured, the the Germans did, they captured, um, among other high ground places, the ridge of, the, the ridge of Messine, and that will be important later, so that's why I'm mentioning it now. I forgot to mention it before I foolishly began to move on to 1915. Forgive me. As I said, I'm changing changing it up a little bit this podcast. So 1915, the British held the strategic high ground of the city of Ypres itself. It sat on a, a rise, and they had held off the German attempt to capture it in 1914. The Germans tried again. They tried again with a massive uh, attempt in mid-April to mid-May of 1915. And the British, they counterattacked. There was definitely some heavy fighting going on in 1915, the Second Battle of Ypres. And again, all those delicate works to drain this really low-lying land just kept getting blasted away by artillery. And that uh, that infrastructure uh, erosion 
is important to remember. So in the second battle of Ypres uh, in 1915, something that's important to mention is that this was the first use of gas, the first use of poison gas by the Germans on both the French and the Canadians who were holding the line at the salient at the time. Understandably so, the French, their line broke amidst the terror of having chlorine gas completely unknown to you, this, this form of attack. It'd be terrifying now uh, to any, anyone listening, myself you know, included, to be under a gas attack, but especially if you have no foreknowledge that poison gas is a thing or that it can be used in warfare, all of a sudden there's this cloud, this pungent yellow cloud wafting towards you, and you don't know what it is, and then all of a sudden people start dying, and uh, it, was utter pa- it was utter chaos and panic, and the French line broke. The Germans almost broke through, but the Canadians held the line. Again, the British Expeditionary Force and their allies saved the day in Ypres. And this is a quote of a Canadian who was there at the first gas attack. It was the afternoon of my birthday, and we noticed volumes of dense yellow smoke coming up and coming towards the British trenches. My company was not in the firing line, and we did not get the full effect of it, but we did, but what we did was enough for me. It makes your eyes smart, and then I became violently sick, but it passed off fairly soon. By this time, the din was something awful where we were. We were under a crossfire of rifles and shells. We had to lie flat in the tent trenches. The next thing I noticed was a horde of those Turcos. French colonial soldiers making for our trenches. Some were armed, some unarmed. The poor devils were absolutely paralyzed with fear. They were holding a trench next to a section of the 48th, so the 48th had to hold it also until some of their officers came and made them all go back. Lance Corporal James Ketty, 15th Canadian Battalion. So right there is an excerpt of a man who was there at the opening of the Second Battle of Ypres in that first horrendous gas attack. And what he said there was that he was in a rear line celebrating his birthday when all of a sudden this dense cloud of gas came over them. And it was somewhat diluted by this point because they were in one of the rear trenches behind the French. And almost simultaneously with that came the French who had fallen back. And it wasn't until some of their officers were able to get called forward to reorganize the French, the colonial troops, as he lists. Lance Corporal James Ketty says that they were Turcos, French colonial soldiers. So after the Second Battle of Ypres, there was a slight lull throughout 1916. So 1914 saw the first battle, 1915 saw the second battle, and 1916 saw a series of small local battles that were waged by both sides to strengthen their respective positions. As I said, this was very low-lying country, and any kind of land rise is very important. Uh, So there were some small local actions to try to gain these land rises. And, however, there were no major offensives in 1916 at the Ypres salient, and this is due to the battles of Verdun and the Somme, and those were going on in 1916, and they were really draining resources. So despite some slight diversionary actions in support of those larger offensives, the Ypres salient was rather quiet in 1916, if you could call it that. It was still a awful place of death, and by 1916, two massive offensives had already been fought uh, over this ground. All that infrastructure keeping the water out of this low-lying country uh, was destroyed. The English started bringing in some private engineering firms to rebuild this area because it was becoming very difficult to move anything around anywhere during the rainy, wet season in the salient. So, 
1916 was not a very hot year, although it was still quite horrible for those that had to endure it there, I'm sure. And this brings us into 1917, where I start my video. In June of 1917, the Battle of Messine Ridge was... Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually move back. Blah, 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 blah. So this brings us into 1917. And that's where I start my video. And there's been a lot of debate among, among historians as to why the third battle of Ypres happened. Two battles had already happened there. The ground was very hard to fight over under good conditions due to the ruining of the local Dutch infrastructure. And there has been contention among historians as to why this third battle was fought. A lot of people just quite simply blame the commander of the British Army, Sir General uh, Douglas Haig. Haig. And I don't, I don't think that that's fair. I think Haig had some seriously good reasons uh, in his mind at the time with the knowledge he had to wage an offensive there. And I'm going to do my best uh, to put those forward here. I went through and read Sir Douglas Haig's private diary, which is available online for free in PDF format. You can go find it for free, as I did. Uh, I can link it in the description as well. I think I will. And in that book, uh, in his private memoirs, you get a sense of the kind of pressure Haig was under in 1917. The Germans had captured some of the Belgian coast. The British had stopped their advance for the most part, but the Germans had still managed to capture some of the Belgian coast and begin operating U-boats off of the coast there. And they, these U-boats were a complete new technological advancement in warfare. The Germans, you know, they made a lot of technological first steps in the first war. They used gas and U-boats were another really important aspect of the technological war. These U-boats were putting a serious stranglehold on the Allied shipping coming in and out of England from America. As we know, uh, famously, the Americans were brought into the war after a number of their ships were torpedoed and sunk by unrestricted uh, U-boat operations in the Atlantic, and the Lusitania was sunk and that brought the U.S. into the war in 1917. So Haig found himself in an interesting place. The Western Front was a stalemate, and men were getting wasted, utterly wasted, uh, entire divisions just getting dwindled away into nothing in massive attacks like the Somme, Verdun, um, the battles and the salient. Uh, these were all incredibly horrendous, costly actions, and for little gain. Haig knew it, and so did the British War Cabinet and uh, the French. This caused a pretty serious debate as to how to proceed in 1917. It, Haig really wanted a war of attrition. He really wanted to continue waging attacks on the Western Front that he could control. That's important. He wanted the power. Haig wanted to control the, the flow of the battle, the flow of the war, and he wanted that to be on the Western Front where he had the most sway. And Haig wanted to continue using large-scale offensives to dwindle down the Germans. If he couldn't break through their lines, he wanted to break their morale, and he wanted to break their manpower. He just wanted to kill as many Germans as possible, and as long as he was losing less British he felt that he would war, win the war of attrition. And that kind of thinking really leads to the horrendous human toll that we see coming out of the Third Battle of Ypres, where half a million men of both sides are swallowed up by the battle, either as casualties or literally swallowed up by the mud of the rising water table of the ruined Dutch landscape. So in 1917, Haig was under pressure not only to continue 
the attack where he could control it. He was also under pressure because the Russian communists had led their first revolution in the spring, and they were pledging to bring Russia out of the war if they if they succeeded in taking over uh, Russia and overthrowing the Tsarist government. Haig knew that if this pressure was released from the Eastern Front, if the war ended in the East, then massive amounts of central power British, Austro-Hungarian troops would suddenly be freed to move west. And this delicate stalemate, this war of attrition where numbers mattered so much, it would all get thrown into disarray, and very quickly the Germans would have massive amounts of reserves to win the war of attrition and possibly break through uh, with a massive offensive that the British couldn't hold. And the French, for that matter, either. The French army was actually facing some serious morale issues at this point in the war. As I said, the French were also aware that the Western Front was going nowhere. It was a stalemate. It was an atrocious stalemate, and entire French units were beginning to mutiny in 1917. So Haig was really pressured on multiple level, on multiple fronts, to seize the initiative, he felt he was alone. He felt that he could not really rely on the French as much as he would have liked. And this is all leading to another massive offensive where he knew he could control it. And one of those few places was the Eeps salient. When I was reading Sir Douglas Haig's private memoirs, I came across the interesting reality that some of the British War Cabinet were actually giving him some pushback against this idea. He wanted to do a massive Western offensive for the reasons I've listed. And the War Cabinet was thinking, well, you know, the Western Front is a stalemate. Things are actually starting to heat up in Italy at this point. The Germans are, the Austro-Hungarians and Germans are making some advancements in Italy right now. Why don't we, as in the British, the Allies, start sending more material and men to Italy and try there for a breakthrough, try there for an offensive breakthrough, because we know the Western Front has stalemated. They wanted to send guns and men and resources to Italy. And Haig, this really threatened Haig. I discovered in his private memoirs that he was facing quite a bit of anxiety about these guns, as he put it, getting sent to Italy. He wanted control of those resources. He wanted those resources on the Western Front where he could implement them, where he could oversee, and where he could create what he dreamed of as an offensive breakthrough and uh, win the entire war. So after some pretty serious bickering, it seems, Haig got his way, and he got everything he wanted. He got a massive Allied army put together, for a third offensive at the Eeps salient. So this is where the roots of Passchendaele are found. And a lot of people have put serious blame on Sir Douglas Haig for the battle. Whereas in reality, he was facing a massive broad picture uh, pressure from the Eastern Front, from the Italian Front, Uh, from the unreliability and failing condition of the French to seize initiative and uh, push through the Germans, which he felt were weaker than ever at this point. Haig felt it was a perfect time to wage an offensive. So France, the Somme, had failed in 1916. Haig felt that attacking through the British salient in the north in Belgium at Ypres was a good idea. So that's the genesis of the battle, and that's what I think a lot of people do not give Haig credit for, is that he was put in a pretty seriously rock and a hard place. Uh, I mean, what would you have done? I don't know. I probably would have done something similar. So let's not be so quick to judge. And this brings us into the preparations for the Battle of Ypres, the third Battle of Ypres. At this point, it's... It might be kind of fancy-dancy historian jargon to separate the three battles of Ypres because there had been constant fighting at the salient 
for the entire war at this point if there were not major offensives being launched as in 1914 and 1915 there was a continuation of local battles uh, as seen in 1916 and beyond where the Germans and the British were constantly vying f with artillery bombardment and you know sniping and smaller attacks to gain high ground that was of strategic importance on the low ground and uh, continue the bloodletting. It never really stopped. So you could actually contend whether or not it was just a single massive battle of Ypres, you know, lasting for years. But I think it's easier for people to wrap their heads around this three-part idea of the first battle in 1914, the second battle in 1915, and then the third and final battle in 1917. Final may be the wrong word because they, they did end up fighting more uh, in 1918, of course, you know, until the war ended. So I'm not going to do too much more of this me just droning on and giving you historical background. I don't think I'm that good at it. What I really want to bring you is excerpts from this book where uh, the authors, Nigel Steele and Peter Hart, really do a good job at bringing the words of the men who are there in this hell to you, to the reader, uh, and I'm going to try to you know, bring that over the interwebs to your ears. I'm going to get to that as quickly as possible, but I do want to mention that in June of 1917, preparations began for the Third Eep, and this was, again, strategic vying for high ground. As I mentioned in 1914, the British had yielded some of the high ground to the initial German onslaught. They just couldn't hold the Germans back in their entirety. So in 1917, they knew that if they were going to attack again, some of these high points that the Germans had captured initially, they needed to be captured back, or otherwise the artillery bombardment would be fully uh, observed from these points, and any kind of British advance would just get pulverized by... German artillery observers who could call in artillery, you know, precisely on advancements. So in June of 1917, the Battle of Messine Ridge was launched, and this was a success by the British, if you can call it that. It was a very costly battle, even though at the time uh, they didn't think it was that costly just due to the fact that they'd been losing so many people in their offensives. You know, tens of thousands of men died capturing Messine Ridge, and 19 massive mines were blown up. I believe it's 19. I may have that number wrong. They dug massive explosive-filled mines under the enemy, the German trenches, into this ridge, and blew them up as an attempt to break the trench stalemate. And it worked. It was hundreds of German soldiers, hundreds, thousands of German soldiers actually were vaporized in seconds when all these mines were detonated at once. The Germans knew that the British were doing some mining operation underneath the Messine Ridge, but they had no idea how big it was. And when the British launched their attack, uh, it caught them, caught them off guard, and the British were successful. They captured the high ground of the Messine Ridge, and this allowed... Sir Douglas Haig to proceed forward with his offensive as planned. And that's when we get into the Battle of Passchendaele, which I did my photo essay on. And in July of 1917, a full month, over a month actually, after the uh, Battle of Messine Ridge, Battle of Messine Ridge ended officially on the 14th of June. And on the 31st of July, uh, Haig launched the Battle of Pilkham Ridge, which began the offensive of the Third Battle of Ypres. And it took three days to capture the Pilkham Ridge, and they suffered 32,000 casualties. The British did, the Allies did. So on the first few days of Passchendaele, 10,000 men were lost a day. And this bloodletting continued for the most part until December. I could go through and individually list every single individual action that consisted of the Eep, the third Eep battle, but I'm going to break it down like this and then move into the book. As I said, this is a this is a battlefield dominated by high ground. 
and especially so when the water table is so high. You want to stay out of the mud. You also want to get good artillery observation because that be has become the primary method of offense and de defense in this static Western Front trench warfare, the use of indirect artillery fire. So the Third Battle of Ypres consisted of really deadly, horrendous pushes by the British uphill to capture German positions that they had captured in 1914 or had held initially the whole time. They wanted to push towards the village of Passchendaele itself, which is southwest of Ypres, and they wanted to expand the salient. They wanted to make the salient bigger and capture more ground and break through the German lines and create a full-size offensive and reopen the war of movement that was seen early in the war in 1914. Haig was desperate, desperate to get that war of movement back and break out of this static trench uh, defense system, this stalemate that had defined the Western Front for so long. So in 1917, in July, they began the Third Eep, and it was not that successful. I mean, Haig is very optimistic in his writings, partly because he has to be. He's consigning so many men to die, he needs to extrapolate some kind of positive meaning out of this, and that's completely understandable. But when you look at the maps, and you look at actually how much ground is taken, it's, it's horrendous how many casualties are being lost and how many men are being ruined uh, for essentially muddy ridges that are barely anything we would call ridges today. If you live in a mountainous area, I live in the Pacific Northwest of Oregon. I mean, so this is very low-lying ground, and it's kind of anticlimactic, these things that I'm calling ridges, uh, hills, they're not that big. It's, it's very low country, and even that small land rise gives you a serious tactical advantage in such low country. So keep that in mind when I'm talking about ridges and whatnot. But anyways, that is, that is as much as I really want to get into in terms of the raw history of the battle. As I said, it degraded very quickly. The offensive never panned out. The war of movement, the breakout never occurred. And it became isolated actions where the British would move men up despite this horrible landscape that was just ruined and water clogged. They'd move men up. They'd try for an offensive. Sometimes they'd get it. Sometimes they'd have to bring up more men. But what it really took was incredibly dogged, and gruesome fighting to achieve individual objectives. And this is where the names like Bosinga and Polygon Wood begin to emerge because these are individual places that tens of thousands of men are dying for. And usually they have little uh, or major strategic importance for the big picture. So that's to be, that's to be understood. If you want to get into this kind of micro-history of the tactics of the Third Eep, I'm going to recommend you go over to Indy Nidell and the Great War Channel. They've been doing a week-by-week -week study of, in real time, you know, it's the 100-year anniversary of 1918 as I, as I uh, record this podcast, it's 2018. So what Indy Nidell and his crew are doing is every week they're uploading videos of what happened that week. And they certainly did this for Passchendaele in 1917, and it was an incredible series. I'm going to link them as well in the description. So if you want a in-depth, you know, week-by-week -week breakdown of these individual battles of Passchendaele, that's where you got to go. Okay. Now, the part of the podcast that I'm really looking forward to, bringing you the words of these men who were there. I have, as I went through the book and did my initial research, I marked some places and some, some passages that I think really articulate the the sense that I wanted to bring out of my photo essay. So the first reading from this book that I want to bring you is as follows. At 0, 0100 hours, we left and marched round the south side of Ypres, crossed the notorious Menin Road, and up Sea Track to Cambridge Trench. We had to don respirators from then on as we struggled, heavy, laden, 
along greasy, slippery duck boards, or knee-deep in gluttonous mud, trying to avoid falling into shell craters filled with water. It was pitch dark that night, and, what with wearing respirators and being under continuous shell fire of all kinds, it was one of the worst reliefs remembered. I made each man hold on to the haversack worn, in, worn on the back of the man in front. As we progressed slowly along, some shells fell in our trench, causing casualties and confusion. The dead were heaved into shell holes, and the wounded lifted out of the trench and left lying on the surface to await the stretcher bearers. One leading NCO slipped off the track into a huge shell crater full of water. He just disappeared, and could not be got out as the sides of the crater were just gluttonous mud. Captain Philip Christensen, 6th Battalion, Cameron Highlanders. And that's a pretty disturbing account of everyday life in the Eep Salient. As I said, the infrastructure had just been ruined and the water table had risen so that this landscape was just waterlogged. And then the artillery came in and plowed it all up. And it becomes very noticeable reading these men's accounts that the Germans are not really considered the main enemy here in the Eep Salient. It's the salient itself. And I think that's important to remember. Back to the book. And here's another selection that I found that I think is particularly poignant. There was no immediate counterattack, but towards dusk one came in, headed by flamethrowers to add to our misery. This was a new one. Our rifles and light machine guns were now useless, being gummed up with mud and we had to hurl grenades and then use pick handles in close combat. One had no time to feel frightened. It all happened so quickly. I saw a large Hun about to aim his flamethrower in my direction, and Company Sergeant Major Adams, with great presence of mind, fired his very pistol at the man. And that's a flare gun. A very pistol is a flare gun, if you didn't know. Back to the book. The round hit the flamethrower, and with a scream, the man collapsed in a sheet of flame. We beat off this counterattack and formed a line of section posts, under heavy shell fire on any dry areas we could find. We had our tails right up as we succeeded against all the odds. And again, that was Captain Philip Christensen of the 6th Battalion Cameron Highlanders detailing the horrific fighting that took place in the Eep Salient. Their rifles and machine guns were fouled by the mud to the point that they had to beat their attackers to death with their pick handles and use grenades. And at one point a man had a flare gun that he used to to kill that German with a flamethrower. So back to the book here. Every morning, we used to go up this duckboard track from below Bosinga right up to Langemark. We were stepping over a couple of dead men laid across the track because they couldn't be moved onto the side. They'd have been sucked into the mud. They were collected by the Pioneer Party and buried. It was a nightmare because all you had was a couple of duckboards side by side and either side of it was about ten feet of mud, with the top of a tank sticking out of it here and there. If you fell off it, it would take a traction engine almost to pull you out. It was that deep, sucking mud. There's a memorial on the Menin Gate to 60,000 men whose bodies were never recovered in the small Eeps salient. They were all sucked into the mud. The track stopped at Langemark. The place had been flattened to the ground, and there was a board at the side of the road propped up on it, and it was stenciled, This was Langermark. That was the only evidence there that a town ever stood there. 
You couldn't see a building or a tree as far as the eye could see. Private William Collins, Royal Army Medical Corps. In a lot of the images that I use in my photo essay, you see these duckboard tracks either being carried by men or walked on by men. They're ever-present. And that's because they were the only way that you could get around. And as that last selection says, if you fell off the duckboard, it was very likely you would drown in mud. Back to the book. And this is important. As I said, artillery was a really important aspect of World War I battle as it remains today in modern combat. Artillery, indirect artillery fire, is an incredibly powerful and deadly tool that must be used and managed efficiently and effectively. And something that I'm sure a lot of you haven't thought about is that when the mud is so deep you can't walk on it, how can you move large caliber artillery pieces around on this landscape, let alone find a place to put them, let alone find a place to hide them, because it's all just flat mud. There's nowhere to hide your artillery. You become a target for counter-artillery. Enemy planes flying overhead can spot you and bring in gas shell. It was very common for gas to be used against artillery positions or suspected enemy artillery positions to try to dissuade the crews from their work. So the authors here, P Nigel Steele and Peter Hart, do a really good job at bringing all aspects of the battle, not just the frontline soldiers, but also the gunners who had the horrendous task of continually following the front line when it moved and if it moved, and also moving their guns when they were discovered by counter-artillery fire. So back to the book. I made that journey many times. Each time I feared it, and most times we were spotted by the German artillery observers and fired upon. Their field guns have had every yard of our roads and tracks taped to a nicety, and he was and he was wont to loose off two or three rounds if he saw any movement upon them. I can still remember the swift, high-pitched shriek of those small shells as they plugged into the mud near us, exploding harmlessly, luckily for us, in the depths of the morass. We were never hit by the grace of God, for the deep mud was our salvation, that mud which we cursed and in which we stuck and staggered, slipped and slid, tugging our boots out of it each time we made a fresh step. Jerry's shells showered us with filth. They disturbed and riddled and broken corpses, and they reshredded the putrid flesh into scraps. It was easy to go missing if you got hit. The chances were you slipped into some yawning shell hole full of grayly opaque water, concealing unmentionable things, and you drowned there. Wherever you went into this nightmare country, you saw obscene things protruding from the mud. All around us lay the dead, both friend and foe, half in, half out of the waterlogged shell holes. Their hands and boots stuck out at us from the mud. Their rotting faces stared blindly at us from coverlets of mud. Their decaying buttocks heaved themselves obscenely from the filth from which the shell bursts had smothered them. Skulls grinned at us. These corpses were never buried, for it was impossible for us to retrieve them. They had lain, many of them, for weeks and months. They would lie and rot and disintegrate foully into the muck until they were an inescapable part of it to maneuver the harvests of a future peacetime Belgium. Horror was everywhere. One grew accustomed to these things, but I never grew accustomed to the all-prevailing stench of decayed and decaying flesh, mingled with that of high-explosive fumes that hung over miles and miles of what had been sweet countryside, and now was one vast muck heap of murder. Lieutenant R. G. Dixon, 14th Battery, Royal Garrison Artillery.
in that description there is a horrible but accurate portrayal of the photographs that I wanted to bring into my essay. Because the words of these men paint a picture of a hell on earth. And that's exactly what I titled my photo essay. I just, I want people to understand that. I want people to understand that. Back to the book. The night before the battle, I spent in a concrete pillbox, Ferdinand Farm. It had very, very thick concrete walls, but it was a curious sort of place to have a headquarters. It had been built by the Germans, and so the entrance faced the German lines. It had enormously thick concrete walls, but inside it was only about five foot high. At the bottom of the pillbox, there was about two foot of water. The water was simply horrid. It had refuse in it, old tins, and indeed excreta. Whatever, whenever shells burst near it, the smell was perfectly overpowering. Luckily, there was a sort of concrete shelf that the Bosch had made, which was about two foot six off the ground level. On this, four officers and six other ranks spent the night. There wasn't room to lie down. There was hardly room to sit upright, and we more or less crouched there. At the outside of the pillbox, there was an enormous shell hole. I think a 9.2 inch. Across this was a plank, because there was about six foot of water in the shell hole. The only way you could get into the pillbox was over that plank, and inside the shell hole was the dead body of a Bosch who had been there a very long time, and who floated or sank on alternate days according to the atmosphere. It was also lousy. It was not a place I would enter now for a great deal of money, but we were extremely glad to be in it that night. And that was from Lieutenant Douglas Wimberly, 232nd Machine Gun Company. And that's just a, a taste of what it was like to survive in the Eeps salient where you found a captured German pillbox, the back of it facing the enemy, inside of it filled with feet of filthy water, the entrance guarded by the dead. And here's a man glad for that place because this was indeed hell on earth and to be unexposed out in the mud with the corpses was certain death because artillery was constant. And that's another part I wanted to articulate with my photo essay. Just the constant hammering of shells. And what does that do to a man? What does that do to your psyche? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it ruins you. It just, it just ruins you and gives you incredible trauma. Back to the book. What a useless slaughter of innocent lives. Yet it goes on and will do indefinitely till one or the other side has had enough. It wouldn't matter so much if everybody paid an equal share in the sacrifice, yet it is the same men all the time. If you don't get killed on Monday, you can go over the top again on Tuesday, and so on till you get outed. The same men all the time, the only people in the army who yell about the war being preceded till Germany is brought to her knees, etc., etc., are the people in nice, safe, cushy jobs miles behind the line. They are the people who pack the leave boats every three months regular as clockwork. What a game! Oh, my masters, what a game! Lieutenant Joe Cotrail. 1st Battalion, Royal Welsh Fusiliers. And I wanted to bring that little reading there into my podcast this week because morale was not good for obvious reasons. And even today when we point the finger at Sir General Douglas Haig, it seems that the men then were too. 
and all they don't although they do not mention him by name it's obvious that a picture very similar to him is painted in their minds back to the book in the station was a smart clean and strong battalion of the staffords who had just detrained and formed up their colonel looked at my wet miserable muddy filthy unshaven party which included some wounded dick fox had a rifle with bayonet fixed no great coat no equipment only a cotton bandolier and his gas mask he had three days of black growth of whisker and looked terrible i had lost my great coat but my solitary star on each shoulder of my tommy's tunic was clearly visible the colonel came over to me and asked where i had come from i told him and discovered he was going on to that area that night he said your platoon seems to have had a hard time and looks worn out or is it your company no sir i replied it is the battalion sir just then regimental sergeant major ray arrived and seeing me sad with tears in his eyes where's the battalion sir this is it i said and for the first time i felt like breaking down and that was second lieutenant robert johnson of the 16th battalion royal scots just talking about the horrible attrition of men the entire units that would get sent into the salient and utterly destroyed and then they sent in more men and then these men had to watch these bedraggled former shadows of these other units pull out and what do you think that did for their morale going in just a hell on earth and that morale that lack of morale i should say is evident in the next selection which is an after action report where a major general actually loses his cool which is uncommon in this time because maintaining your emotions much like it is now was a sign of a well-balanced man and of good breeding especially back in the day and that's what they wanted in officers in the british army men who would maintain their cool but even the salient brought those men those hardened officers to their knees because here in this after action report the emotion the emotion from this general is obvious here is that after action report excerpt the operations were a failure a the ground was impassable and so powerless were the troops to maneuver that they were shot down while stuck in the mud b the barrage was ineffective and troops were unable to keep up with it c oblique hostile machine gun fire was very effective d the only lewis gun succeeded in getting into action was useless in 3 minutes e all uncovered rifles were useless all covered rifles ditto within 10 minutes f power of maneuver was nil g on this sort of ground men must be extended where sections were in column the whole section was put out of action by machine gun fire to sum up the situation neither fire nor movement was possible and any prospects prospects of success under those conditions were nil major general a b e cater headquarters 58th division and that term neither fire nor movement was possible was written in all caps a rare bit of emotion in a usually dry after action report submitted by a major general whose morale was obviously on the downward slope and if your major general feels that way then you know the men in the front trenches are just going through hell 
back to the book. Things were certainly pretty bad at the guns, the air still reeking of gas, and the ground saturated with the mustard gas liquid, and the men all half blind and covered with mustard gas blisters. Every order had to be given in writing, as neither I nor the NCOs could articulate a word. And to complete the humor of the situation, everyone was sick at every possible opportunity. Major Neil Fraser Teitler, 150th Brigade Royal Field Artillery. And this man is talking about the effects of mustard gas ever present in the atmosphere in the area of the operations here. And in my photo essay, in the second part, the casualties section, I include some graphic images of a man, his entire body burned with mustard gas, holding the hand of the nurse, and his face is just, just emotionless, just dead. And it's just a heartbreaking photo. And that's what mustard gas does to people. And there were more horrendous photographs I had found. Medical color photographs of dead men. And the effects of mustard gas on their bodies. And it takes a lot of mustard gas to kill somebody. Phosgene and chlorine gas are actually deadlier agents. But mustard gas is mainly an awful carcinogenic and irritant. It's meant to distract you blind you, make you cough, make you blister, get you off the line, and keep you off your rifle. And that's why mustard gas was used so extensively against the gunners, to keep them from using their guns. But as Major Neil Fraser Teitler remembers, they went about it anyway. Even though their throats were so burned by mustard gas they couldn't speak, they wrote their orders. And despite this hell, these men carried on, and I think that that's incredibly poignant. Back to the book and the effects of mustard gas. We did not at first realize the full danger of this, and just laughed because no one had a voice. But when people began to blister and swell, and two of my old battery died horribly from eating bread, which had been splashed with this stuff, we got the wind up thoroughly. The whole area was tainted. No one could touch anything with safety. Not even our own doctor, who came to see us, slipped in the mud and was so badly blistered by it that we never saw him again. The gas casualties were bad enough, but oh, the shell casualties were pathetic. I lost many of my greatest friends in the battery, horribly mutilated in the mud, and towards the end was near a raving lunatic as possible. Major Scheel, 250th Brigade, Royal Field Artillery. And that is a insight into the psychological effects of this kind of battle. And Nigel Steele and Peter Hart do a good job of bringing the psychological impact of the Third Eep, let alone the whole Great War, in their epilogue, which is where I want to I wanna finish off. Because it's, it was just heartbreaking for me to read this history, and that's part of why I wanted to create my photo essay the way I did, to bring out the emotion of this battle, the anxiety and the heartbreak of it. Because that's really what I felt reading this history. And part of the heartbreak came from as follows. I was proud that I had been one who had endured its terrors. In those days, I did not guess that there would come a time during my own lifetime when folk no longer gave a tinker's damn whether one had been at the third eep or not. In fact, the vast majority of the people of Britain, as I write these words, have never even heard of Third Eep in the Passchendaele Ridge. Lieutenant R. G. Dixon, 14th Battery, Royal Garrison Artillery.
and that is the last selection of this book that I'm going to read to you today. And something about that last quote there from R.G. Dixon really stuck with me. Because I give a damn. I give a serious tinker's damn that that man was there. And what's really heartbreaking to me is that they're all dead now. The last World War I veteran died years ago. And now as we look at the 100th anniversary of these events, it seems all the more likely that this incredible sacrifice by every single man who went there, every man who became a casualty of this hell on earth, all the more likely that that sacrifice will be forgotten. And when sacrifices like this are forgotten, they are doomed to be repeated. And this apocalyptic hell on earth might just come to pass again. And as our capacity for destruction and as our technology of destruction continues to advance in our westernized society, the possibility that this apocalyptic wasteland could be even worse is ever-present. So, I want to finish this podcast today with two thoughts. Words of thanks to the men today who hold the line and stand shoulder to shoulder against the forces of aggression that seek to that seek to disrupt our peaceful lives here enjoyed by many of us in the United States and beyond in this this world we live in because there is true evil out there and there are brave men and women every day who stand in the face of it and keep us safe Thank you, and I can't thank you enough for enduring the hells on earth so that I do not have to. And the second thought that I'm going to leave this podcast with is a somber one, but it's also a pledge that although I'm not there standing the line, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the sacrifices of those that have and those that continue to will never be forgotten. That I will continue to give a damn, and that those that listen to my podcast and follow my work hopefully will also give a damn too. Don't forget. Because these events were real. And as Nigel Steele and Peter Hart so scathingly articulate in their preface. This is not some abstract Shakespearean play I'm reading from. This is not some, as they put it, performance on stage. It's real. These were real men. And this was real trauma. Thank you for listening to the Modern Military History Podcast. I'm going to continue bringing you a book a week. I'm going to continue to bring you history so that we will never forget these sacrifices. Thank you. And do take care. Until next time. This has been Andrew, signing off.